Jim Donald. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Commissioner, for coming along to give evidence today. I wanted to ask you, first of all, about an issue that's been raised recently with us and has attracted some sort of uh, public concerns as well, and that's about police forces becoming, um, if you like, a sort of service of first resort for incidents which aren't really um, related to crime at all, but more um, related to issues around vulnerability, the most obvious example being mental health crises, for example. To what extent would you say um, your forces' time and resources have been taken up with, with dealing with such issues? Mm. Um, I, we have seen a very large increase, undoubtedly. Um, and is that and if I was to describe, as my predecessor did, you know, the, the, the sort of main role of the police service, mm. and everyone will have their different views, but the main role of the police service, I think, is to prevent crime, and if crime happens to bring people to justice, and if, if, uh, if there's a victim, to make sure they're properly supported. However, throughout history, uh, the British Police Service has done a lot more than just uh, prevent crime and bring people to justice, and it's part of our sort of um, our kind of model of, of policing in this country is that we do do more, and we've f very frequently had a high proportion of our calls that come in that aren't absolutely crimes or aren't regarded as crimes at that point, but are having an impact on somebody like antisocial behaviour, for example, and we will go and problem solve and deal with that in a way that perhaps police services elsewhere won't. We have seen a very large increase uh, in missing persons, as an example. Um, uh, you know, last year we had 56,000 um, missing people. Uh, that's up from 40 odd thousand in 2012. Um, a high proportion of those are teenagers, and the expectation that society and indeed we have about how we will deal with those reports is much higher than it was in 2012 as well, because we're extremely aware of child sexual exploitation as an, as an example and, and grooming. If I turn to mental health, um, we have up now, I'm just looking at my figures, we have uh, about 115,000 calls a year which have what we call a mental health flag. Um, we're sending officers to one of these calls every 12 minutes mm. in London. Um, that's a 33% increase in the last five years. Uh, in the last year alone, we have increased by 18% the um, number of Section 136 uh, sort of interventions that we become involved in where somebody is uh, taken from the street to a place of safety be because of their mental health. 18% um, increase in one year. So the, for me, this is of great concern because I think it's going you know, at the moment one way, and that's up. And we are frequently the service of last resort, and on occasion, I think, forgive me if you didn't say this, Rose, we are on occasion becoming very much the service of first resort. I'm very proud if I take mental health of my officers. They, mm -hmm. When I talk to many of the charities, they'll say they're brilliant, they're very sensitive, they're very compassionate, they t take time, they're, you know, they start at the beginning, they want to help. But they're not, it's not their job, yeah. <laughs> they're not trained to do it, they've got other work to be doing. Uh, and I would very much prefer if um, people in distress uh, were being supported by others than the police officers. Okay, that's very helpful, thank you. Um, in 2016, however, um, HMIC's uh, report on the Met said that support for vulnerable people was inadequate and it highlighted, for example, failures to understand links between um, missing or absent children and uh, CSE uh, and also issues around domestic abuse incidents. So what sort of work is underway to, to respond to, to those criticisms? So we've taken that very seriously indeed. Uh, I have an assistant commissioner uh, who is very clearly in charge of our response to that. A whole series of things have happened over the last several months in terms of um, improving people's training, in terms of some of the uh, structures that we have to allow greater um, sort of resilience, bringing specialists together with generalists. Uh, we have set our standards very much uh, more clearly. Um, we have had a great deal of oversight and interest um, from the Deputy Mayor, but also from uh, other sort of experts around the country telling us how we are doing. Uh, I can see us beginning to shift uh, quite quickly, and I think that's very much to do with one of the prime um, criticisms there, which was about leadership mm -hmm. and the priority that this issue is given in daily business. It is given a very high priority. Um, but if I could just caveat a little bit. Firstly, I think it takes quite a while to get from where we were to where we know we want to be. 
Secondly, though, to come back to the beginning of the um, conversation, we are being exhorted to be very much better, policing generally, mm. at everything, yeah. all the time. And every report that comes in is an isolated report that says you should be better at that. It's not a report that says, <laughs> in the context of, for example, reducing resources or that demand going up or the cost of this change, you might want to think about that. It just says inadequate, up, or insufficient, more. or And that is, I, I genuinely think, as somebody who's been out of prison <coughs> for two years, coming back in, you know, our waterfront is now very broad <laughs> and we are being expected to, to set excellent standards across that waterfront in a way that I think is unsustainable. Sure. And uh, completely doing exactly what you just warned against <laughs> and picking an isolated sort of type of work. There's another... Um, a critical report, which wasn't about the Met in particular, but policing in general in relation to um, modern slavery, and there were various sort of criticisms made about, again about leadership, um, even sort of recognition of, of when the crime takes place, um, and also intelligence sharing. Mm -hmm. To what extent do you think those criticisms uh, apply to the Met, and, and what sort of response can we expect from from your force? Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you know we're absolutely long way. Perfect. Uh, this is a subject that um, my predecessor has been very high profile in taking seriously, and so have I. Um, our, again, our referrals have increased hugely 270 in 2015, over 1,000 last year, 1,300 already this year. Uh, we have a very good training package for all our staff. Um, we are beginning to understand more about labour exploitation, although most referrals at the moment are about sexual exploitation. Um, we haven't had a huge increase in arrests uh, or indeed in prosecutions, uh, but I have a, a very capable unit that deals with that. Uh, you know, we have a, a sort of specialist unit that deals with the um, with kidnap and modern slavery and can advise our, our sort of generalists about how to um, respond. There are some real challenges, as you know, in terms of bringing people to justice. You know, the reluctance sometimes of victims, the fact that they don't see themselves as victims. Um, the fact that you know they may see themselves as victims, but it's better than they, where they were. Uh, lack of trust in authorities generally, no other option. It isn't easy to get uh, a joined-up approach. But I, you know, I've spoken many times to Kevin Highland, who I know well, who's in the Slavery Commission, about how we could improve. Um, and we do take this. Uh, we do take this really seriously. That's, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, could I turn now to the, the issue of Brexit again? Um, mm. I mean, could you say just? Very briefly, how significant important for the Metropolitan Police access to EU justice and home affairs institutions and, and databases is. And could you also tell us, have you done any work um, to assess what the implications would be if there was no justice and home affairs agreement um, for after Brexit? Um, so to go to your last uh, point first, uh, no, I haven't, not personally. Um, we have, uh, as I said, talked to um, uh, the Home Office uh, and colleagues in DEXU about the measures uh, that we currently have, how they work and the importance of uh, them to us. Um, London is probably the most cosmopolitan and international city. Uh, it's a, uh, and its police force has a global reach, partly because of organised crime, partly because of counter-terrorism, partly because of our population. I believe we need to maintain that in the future, whatever our you know, relationships with other countries at a political level, um, we will continue to have good police-to-police -police relationships, we will have counter-terrorism officers working in various different places, and we will continue to host here, I think at the moment it's 48 law enforcement officers from other countries working really closely with the Met, we'll go on doing that. But right now, uh, as I speak, I would anticipate that in custody, in our uh, custody suites as an example, somewhere around about 30, might be 35 percent of the people in custody will be what we call foreign national offenders. Of those, about half will come from um, EU countries. Uh, we work really closely with colleagues uh, in EU countries, both directly and through the institutions, and we rely hugely on um, the Euro well, we use the European Arrest Warrant heavily. We do, the Met does very large numbers of joint investigations. We're a big user of that particular um, arrangement, much the biggest. Uh, we, of course, rely on this too. 
on a on a minute by minute basis. Um, so uh, you know we are not going to get involved obviously in any politics or negotiations, but we look forward to uh, we hope being able to keep London safe in the same kind of way in the future as we currently do. Sure, and, and I'm sure everyone around this table hopes the same. But is there not a degree of complacency if we are not doing any preparation for the event that there might not be? So justice and home affairs or security treaty, would, would it not be advisable for organisations such as your own to undertake that work? Apart from anything else, if politicians were able to realise implications of there being no such deal, it might make such a deal um, more likely. Um, so I've said I haven't, pers- I mm. haven't personally. What, what we've done, I think, is lay out what we currently do, how it works, and how important that is for our work. Um, if, if uh, you know, take for example. Um, needing for either a short or a longer period to go to uh, extraditions. I have, as, it, as it happens, I have had conversations with people in which I've pointed out just how different and difficult that could be. Um, but we haven't, and I don't think it is the job of the Metropolitan Police to do a full impact assessment. Um, but I'll, I mean, I've listened to what you said. I, I take your point. We should we should think the unthinkable and work out what on earth we would actually potentially be, be ending up to do, and, doing. And very finally, if I could just revisit a question that, that Mr. Doughty put to you in a slightly different way, because one of the possible sort of blocks to a sort of deal are concerns about data protection and yeah. uh, bulk surveillance powers and so on. So putting aside uh, questions of ethics and, mm-hmm. and and what the law should be and so on. Operationally, what would you say is more important for your uh, force and its work? Um, is it bulk retention of data, or would you say it's uh, ongoing access to uh, EU databases? I couldn't. I couldn't answer that question. Um, I think it's. it's, it, it's no, I just couldn't answer that question. Um, uh, we work, for example, extraordinarily closely with the intelligence agencies on counterterrorism. They depend on very different things from what we depend on. Um, both are important. Uh, I, I couldn't say one is more important. Thank you very much.